Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. I'm your host, Kamal Murray, and we are here with one of the most instrumental guys uh, in American men's tennis. Uh, he's a USTA national coach, uh, coach of the 2020 Olympic team during the COVID Olympics. Um, he, he and I coached a player we, we all know and love, Sloan Stevens. He's coached Marty Fish, Query, touched just about everybody on the men's side. We're here with the legend, David Nankin. David, thanks for coming to the show. Well, thanks for having me, Kamal. Pleasure. So when I look at you, I first got, got to know you when I was training at Carson during the offseason. And you'd be on the other side training with the guys, and we'd see the guys just shuffle in and out, right? And I remember initially thinking, wow, that looks like a lot of fun. You know, you got guys battling out, playing points, uh, where the women sort of kept to themselves, right? They kind of had their own sort of r- routine and not necessarily this um, – good old boys kind of club where we're hanging out, working out. I was like, man, that looks like some fun stuff one day. So tell, tell us, and, but you've also coached on the women's side. So tell us about uh, the opportunity you've had to work with and touch almost all American men. Well, I started with the USD in 2004 uh, as a national coach, I was given a great opportunity and, and also uh, that was on the men's side and typically with the training center west out in LA we've just been lucky to have great weather and a lot of players and I remember starting with Sam Query I think when he is he's probably the first uh young pro call a transitional pro we started working with that lived in Los Angeles he is from Thousand Oaks started driving down when he was in high school you know we had so many so many guys that were younger you know Marcus Jerome is 14 Marty Fish moved here from LA when he you know got married to his wife Stacy. We had Stevie Johnson in college at, at USC, Bradley Klon coming down from Stanford, Jared Donaldson had moved back from Argentina, so, and just to name a few. So we had great energy with guys. Jack Sock gave it a brief stunt. That, you know, all the guys at least tried it. LA is not for everybody, but the, the people that stayed here made that, you know, I think the more you can get a lot of players together, competition is a, is a big part of my philosophy and beating each other up and and uh you know then along came taylor fritz and he was 15 years old and i think taylor's uh benefited greatly from being around marty fish and query and steve johnson and bradley Khan. i mean he was 16 years old playing all these guys a lot of practice sets and and i think it added to his his real uh steep growth initially that first year in 2015 when he rose to 53 out of the world, uh, you know, in about seven months. So look, anytime, I think any training center can have the more players you can have, the better is obviously you're going to have the courts and it's well staffed. I mean, all the players could bring their private coaches to work with and strength, whatever kind of resources we could provide them. Um, and we still try and continue to do that. So you look at like these waves, right? Like with Felix and Shapovalov and Ron is, you know, we saw a few years ago, Canada had a wave. And even on the women's side, they've got uh, Andrescu and Fernandez, right? And Bouchard, they, they sort of have these waves. And I think now we are starting, we've seen Italy have their men's wave right now. I mean, just tons of great players, right? Uh, but I think we're starting to see those young players who were able to benefit from the Stevie J's, from the Mike Russell's, from yep. Mar- being around Marty, like Francis, Taylor, Tommy Paul, mm-hmm. Jerome, right? We're starting to see that sort of emergence. So number one, how did that work? Because I look at Italy now and I'm looking like, okay, what did they do to sort of have this crop of young men all kind of burst at the same time? You know, was it like, we're going to do DNA tests, right? And all the parents are going to be former soccer players and parents, you know, moms will be 5'10", 5'11". Like, how do you, how do we systematically create waves of players like we're starting to see? Well, it starts with identification at a young age. Uh, with our wave of U.S. players now, um, it was no secret. We saw these guys in a big group of players when they're 
they were 13 years old, 13, 14, when we started doing a lot of camps with them. So in the case of Italy, if you look at their, you know, you can just look at their tournament structure and whether they had the players and a big group of them at 15, 16, um, they probably, you know, it, I think it's a snowball effect of having tournaments, players, they've got some great coaches. And I do think it's a little cyclical. They happen to have, you know, two players in the top 10 right now and two great players. And then they've got a ton of players in the top 100. But I think in the U.S. now we have eight players under the age of 25 in the top 50 for the first time since 1996. And, you know, and I think 30, 14 players in the top 100, 13 or 14. So, uh, and that's a combination of a hybrid of some of the older players that are still sticking around and playing a little longer. And the young guys that have all pushed through. I mean, last year we had, you know, Nakashima pushed through, Jensen Brooksby, look at uh, Maxime Cressy came out as a little bit of a late bloomer out of, out of UCLA. And, and when, one, when one player does well, it really helps your buddy down the street or your competitor it really uh, enhances that. Well, if he can do it, I can do it. And I remember a great story with uh, when Mackie McDonald broke through and made the round of 16 at Wimbledon out of the blue. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Jerome was a year younger than him at school. And uh, Jerome asked Mackie, he goes, well, how did that feel? And Jerome said, feels unbelievable. <laughs> so Jerome moved to Orlando. He goes, I'm going to do exactly what Mackie McDonald did. And I'm going to see if I can have the same results. And he did. So once he got established, he moved back to LA because that's where his home is. And that certainly helps to have you know, the two training centers that are both well utilized. We have great red, red clay courts down in Orlando where all the guys get together, you know, post Miami and do a little training camp there. But, um, and the, the key is also to, to always keep the base coming. You know, we, we, at the time when we started with these young Americans now, they were identified as mostly the 97s. And I remember Diego Moyano, uh, who was working with Dennis Kudler and Ryan Harrison at the time, being given that as a high priority uh, scope of the job, is to make sure these 13, 14 year olds were, were well taken care of. And they, that started with a lot of camps, ITF trips, futures, training in Spain, um, you know, allocation of resources, a lot of, a lot of that went to the, that big group of young guys that, that moved through. So we talk about 14 at the top, you know, 14 Americans in the top 100. And we talked about early identification. And I think early on, you know, that's like one of the tricks is like, who's looking, what are they looking for, right? To judge talent, because in a lot of countries, if the person that's the judge doesn't think you got it, then you sort of aren't invited to that next way with that next special group of training, et cetera. And I think one of the stories that pops out of my head is like Francis TFO, right? Back when he was a kid, there was a lot of talk about his forehand and his technique and some of like the unorthodox strokes. And I think now we don't hear that as much, right? We, we hear more about his right. discipline and commitment and that kind of stuff. Once he kind of got that right, that sort of went away. So even Tommy's forehand, so you look at Tommy Paul, you know, it's kind of got a non-traditional forehand, kind of lays his hand down. Uh, and if I look at Taylor Fritz, you know, big guy, doesn't strike you as somebody with a lot of foot speed, but can cover the court really well, right? Were those three people that you like knew were going to make it? Or were you kind of like, eh, if we work on this or if he fixes this, right? Because they all could do some things better, right? Um, naturally. Well, I remember all these guys at 15 and there's, you know, firstly, there's, you know, less judgments better and keeping the groups as big as possible. That's what we did when, when uh, they were 15 and just trying to identify areas of focus where they can improve. Uh, I remember what we used to hear about Taylor Fritz is that he's, you know, his movement might stop him from being in the top 10. Well, he's in the top 10. <laughs> it certainly didn't stop him from moving. He worked really hard at for five years as an area that he worked really hard at. And another part would be maybe Taylor's grip changes on his forehand, and you know did well with that. Taylor, had the Taylor, I mean uh, Francis had the unconventional strokes. Um, you know, I think everyone kept an eye on it, but never did they dismiss. It's tough to really dismiss anybody with work ethic, love for the sport that can handle pressure. And, you know, it comes from a good, solid background and 
also has the ability to to travel, to to emotionally keep it together at a young age. These guys all had each other. They really supported it, uh, supported each other through all the traveling, and they're really close friends today. But uh, you know, I think just keeping as as a coach, being really open minded to see and try and I see what is possible and what is capable and where the players can grow for all these guys that, you know, I think to be great, you've got to have a, a weapon. Um, and otherwise, if you have no weakness, you, you can be good. So mm -hmm. now one of the famous stories, I love Tommy when he says, man, I want to go to North Carolina so bad, but they wouldn't offer me a full scholarship. I went on, he went, took a visit. He did that. Um, you see a lot of the next wave, right? And what is the, and we've seen a lot of people go to schools like UCLA, USC, uh, North Carolina and have good careers. Those guys that are in front of you that are like high school juniors or seniors, how do you advise them on whether to go to college or to turn pro right away? Well, you know, I, me, myself, I went to UCLA, so, you know, I would probably, for the most part, unless you have an incredibly good financial situation, encourage a year or two of college. Um, Taylor Fritz had committed to USC. Riley Apolka had committed to USC. And if they didn't have great results, they would have gone. Tommy Paul, I think, had committed to, was going to Georgia, maybe. Georgia, yep. And... Um, so I think every situation is different, but if I, my advice professionally, if there's a bit of a question mark is to go to college. And I think pick, to pick the right college is more, is the most important part of, of that process where you, where they're going to play, who's going to be the coach developmentally, your, your mindset doesn't change. You're still going to go to college thinking that you want to be top 10 in the world. I mean, I think Cameron Norrie, you know, is a great example of that. Is someone who utilized college and 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 used that to his to his advantage. Jensen Brooksby and Brandon Nakashima are two great examples as well. Somebody just went for a year, and actually both players didn't do great at college, but they 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 blossomed when they got out. At least from the guy's side, I think there's a a, a physical component to it as far as where they are in their development. A lot of players at at 18 are physically not ready for the demands of the professional tennis tour and that year or two at college just gives them a little bit of a, a window where they can probably put on a better weight and some muscle and maybe their game needs a little time to, de to develop as well. I think John Isner is a great example of, of a player that benefited four years from college and, you know, physically he wasn't ready to go at, at 18. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of great examples and, then you look at, you know, Andy and Marty that were, uh, you know, great ITF players. I think Andy was one and Marty was maybe in the top five. They, they decided to turn pro and, um, and they, they got it done. So I think it's a case-by-case -case situation, which is carefully, carefully evaluated. But uh, I've seen some, uh, I'd say I've seen some more disaster stories of players that didn't go to college and then turn pro too early mm -hmm. than players that have gone to college and just been a little more patient with the process. And you can also look at how long the, the men are playing these days. Um, they, before, you know, in the late nineties, uh, in the mid to late nineties, 30 years old was, was old for a tennis player. You know, I think Andre Agassi was the first pioneer for a player to play <laughs> past the age of 30. And, and, and now it seems like the norm to be playing in your, in your, early to mid 30s. So there's certainly no rush to, to start a professional career at, at 20 years old and, and, and get a little development under you. So that if you're good enough and, you, and, you, and you're dominating the challenger circuit at 17 and you're getting some big, big contracts, then I'd say give it a go. I remember um, you mentioned Brandon Nakashima playing for UVA. They played the indoor championships here in Chicago. UVA was practicing at my facility. Brandon was playing number four and they were practicing. And I remember yeah. calling Chris McCormick and was like, there's this kid playing for UVA. Watch out for him. You got to sign him. And he was saying, come on, he's playing number four. Yeah. And I was like, I know, but the kid can play, right? So yeah. this is like, you know, 
February time, right? Right. A couple months later, he plays uh, Jack Sock in the Indian Wells 125. And I think he beats him. And he's like, come out, you're right. I'm going to sign yeah. that guy, right? Yeah. So you, you look at all these players where I feel on the men's side, a couple years of college to kind of beef up helps you. Whereas on the women's side, you kind of can jump out there a little earlier, right? Yeah, you could. I mean, look, the the on the women's side, typically the the girls develop a little a little quicker. They 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 mature a little earlier, and that's kind of been for the most part the girls getting out there a little younger. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So you and I coached. I said one of the, one of the first times I got to know you was 2013 when uh, Sloan was playing Azarenka, and you were like, you know, the, the one of the key people who helped her get to the semis Australian Open. And that was really like her year to win it, right? And we saw, you know, Vika have the panic attack, a loss of breath. Tell me what that ride was like. Because I've been on that ride where you get to the semis and finals of a slam and you're just like, all right, got a good draw, playing well, seeing it well, healthy, everybody's happy. Let's just not fuck it up, right? Tell, tell me about that ride that year. Well. Sloan was, you know, she spent a, she, uh, about 10 weeks at the off season getting, got really fit, was playing great. And she was about as ready to go for that Australian trip uh, that she'd ever been in. And um, so she beat Serena, I think, in the quarterfinals around a 16. And that was yeah. a, a big milestone for her. And then obviously Sloan was probably starting to become one of the favorites at, at the Australian Open, played as a rank in the semis, as Vico was playing well, it was a good match. And I can't remember at what point as a ranker took a timeout, but I, I think it was about 10 minutes. Yeah. And I re remember, I'd never, I don't think I'd ever seen that before. Now we see it in the, you know, the people leaving the court all the time, but that was the first time I'd ever seen a player leave the court for that long. And I think Sloan might have been ahead in the match at that time, and it completely changed the momentum. And there were a lot of question marks after the match about was what was Azarenka behaving within the rules of tennis? And she claimed there was a medical uh, issue, but um, it certainly, uh, I thought, changed the dynamic of the match. And Sloan wasn't the same. Having that long a break, maybe starting to think ahead getting a little ahead of herself, uh, definitely changed the momentum and, and she lost the match. And I think, uh, yeah, that was, that was, that was a tough one. Uh, but eventually she, I think Kamal with you, she eventually got it done. Yeah, got it done. <laughs> but th th those rides are always like very yeah. eventful, never a dull moment. Yeah. Um, and I see, we see it now. I mean, we see now players taking timeouts right before their opponent serve, not even on odd games, you know, just, yeah. oh, I, I need to go take a seat. I mean, we've seen Andrescu just flat out go and sit down, right? So we're yeah. starting to see some of this more. And when I see it, I think back to, wow, it was 2013 when that first started to happen and we yeah. probably should have stopped it then. Right. Because now it's like on the men's side and the women's side. Well, it's being used as a tactic. I, I was, uh, I did, traveled some challenger events this summer and even at the challenger level after every set the, uh, the players leave the court to go change and they you know it's just a big some of them not even sweating that much it's got a <laughs> hog bag on the shoulder and they're out the gate i'm like so i don't know why the, i think the atp have put a limit on it at five minutes now that you if you leave the court you're going to be back in the bathroom proximity and um they've certainly tried to address the rules but you know, you can watch the tennis back in the 90s. No one ever left the court yeah. you know, and very few timeouts or medical timeouts. So hopefully, uh, this, you know, it's the sport and we can get a hold of that and, and make it a, a continuous flow. Because it has impact. I mean, they, these are career changing wins. Right. That we've seen some of this sort of impact. Right. And I think right. that, you know, it's a tactic and it shouldn't be employed. So you had the honor of being the Olympic coach during yes. the 2020 or 2020 Olympics. Uh, we call it the COVID Olympics. And I think of, of all the Olympics, that is probably one of the most, of this era, one of the most mysterious ones 
because of COVID protocols, you, everything was sort of secluded and isolated and you know, people weren't able to bring their family and entourage and private coaches, et cetera. And even from a social media standpoint, I really feel like we only saw what the players posted. It wasn't a lot of B-roll of just, you know, normal stuff you would see. Uh, tell us about that experience. A, the honor of being an Olympic coach, right? And B, having the unique opportunity, once in a lifetime opportunity to be an Olympic coach during, in those circumstances. Well, it was an honor to be selected as, as the Olympic coach. And we took uh, Kathy Rinaldi, coach Captain Rinaldi, and I took six guys and six girls. And look, we, we traveled to Wimbledon and the French and experienced, you know, that bubble environment. So I don't think that was that um, unfamiliar to us. But it was, you know, obviously had, they had zero fans. I think Wimbledon at that, that year had some fans. So there was no fans, no entourages players and they weren't able to bring their private coaches and, and, and etc so um, but i tell you what when the tennis got started and you saw some what really stood out to me are, were the first round doubles matches and the urgency and the desire and the competitiveness of all these players to try and to to win a medal you know uh, one match that really stood out to me was Francis Tiofo and Rajiv Ram playing first round against Rublev and Kachanov. <laughs> they won the back courts with nobody watching. It's some of the greatest tennis I've ever seen. And there's no clapping. There's maybe five of us and five of the Russian team. And the third set goes to a super tiebreaker. So that made it even more exciting. So, uh, you know, that was just one match that stood out. And then, you know, then you get the mixed doubles, which is incredible. It's only a six, 16 draw and you see everybody's trying to play in the mix and you know Rublev who went out earlier actually ended up winning a gold medal in the mix doubles and that's how important that was to him but you bet look guys tried hard we were in in uh, tennis Sangren and Austin Krychek were were playing for a bronze medal against the New Zealand team Michael Venus um, mm -hmm. and even though they were playing for a bronze medal the tension the you knew what was at stake they were playing for a bronze medal. And if they weren't winning that, we're coming home empty handed. And they lost that in a tough one. And it was, it was uh, a tough one to swallow to come home and as hard as everyone competed, but uh, to not, to not win any medals, but what a great experience and, and to be there. And hopefully Paris 2024 will be a normal Olympics for everybody. Um, but, and we look forward to that. So, you know, under those circumstances with no fans and no sort of entourage, right? You would think you had the opportunity to meet in a very uh, more relaxed setting, the other athletes from the other countries without all the security, et cetera, et cetera. Who did, who did you have the opportunity to, to, to meet that you probably wouldn't have had it been a normal Olympics with big teams and entourage and protection? Yeah, it's, it's definitely easier to move around and watch matches. But, you know, the, the unfortunate part about this Olympics is you weren't allowed to go watch other sports. Oh. So that was probably, the for all the players, a big, you know, talking point that we, just because of the policy involved, we weren't allowed to go to. So, you know, you felt that because you you only at the tennis courts and that was all you're allowed to go watch. So that was... Uh, besides meeting the other athletes in the village, that, that was a little, that was one of the policies that you had to accept. So you couldn't see any other sports. And so it just felt like you're at this very, very prestigious Olympic tennis tournament. Oh. <laughs> and since you do have the opportunity to see all the next talent, right? And have a large hand in, you know, who we move forward uh, with, who's coming up next, right? I mean, that's, probably not playing at the tour level events, uh, but maybe as, you know, one foot in college, one foot trying to play 15s and 25s that you think has some talent and just needs a little time, but will eventually make it. I mean, we see Ben Shelton, obviously, this summer, right? We gave him a wild card into our um, 80K here in Chicago, gets to the finals, right? takes a quality wild card in the Cincy, make converts that into a main draw wild card 
beats the top five player in the world and now is going pro, right? So we've seen how the domino, who do you see like that where one or two good weeks and a couple wild card opportunities and then they're on their way? Well, I always like to look, I'm a, a big proponent of the next gen uh, year end tournament. And I remember when, when Taylor made the next gen finals and players that the normal tour probably wouldn't have heard about Tsitsipas, pass rublev tfo her cats they're all there at the next gen it's you know that that kind of pathway with players making the next gen have really followed through and be, and turned out to be to be great players so i'd i always look to see who's, who's going to be in that tournament and obviously alcaraz and 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 Sinner, that's it's another you know planet or universe that he's operating in but uh, i think they're there are a lot of good in the on the American side. You know, we just had five guys, you know, get inside 240, 250 that we'll see at the qualities at the Australian Open that have done well in challenges that have moved through. Ben being one of them, Brandon Holt being another one, Zach mm. Spider being another one, Emilio Nava. And I'm just these are players that you didn't see at slams that you will start seeing. We'll see because they're going to be inside 250 in the world. And then from there, who's going to be great? I mean, time will tell but we certainly got got the talent pool and then we can go to the younger guys i mean we got a pretty steady at least i'm talking from a, a guy's perspective you know we got uh, the birth year classified as the o fives the good players have done well you know ethan quinn and kyle kang and lerno one kalamazoo as a as a 16 year old um so uh you know i'm not i probably missed out some names but certainly there's more players coming up who's going to work the hardest and be be not just the hardest, but the smartest as well and get out there and be competitive. I think we'll get through. So, yeah, we had uh, Zach, I think at the semis of our tournament, Ben, Brandon, obviously mom is uh, Tracy Austin. So it's in, it's in the genes. Yeah. Um, and we're actually hosting the boys super national 16s over Thanksgiving. Yeah. So I'm wow. interested to see, yeah, you know, the indoors who who sort of comes out yeah. of that. Yeah. Um, and then so we think about the USTA, right? And we think a USTA has gotten has managed to like stay intact and actually do well and support these players. Um, and we've seen, I mean, the men, what, what's happening with the men is like an example. How has that been? Because you were a private coach traveling for a little while, and then you obviously got married, had a baby. And now what is it like now to be able to be at home, right? And, and work for the Federation, right? And have a little bit more of a predictable lifestyle. Well, I've always, my lifestyle, I've always, for the most part, traveled, um, you know, on the, whether it's on the tour, I've done some ITF traveling on the juniors. And fortunately, we've always had the training center where we've had players and we've hosted camps, regional camps, you know, um, and now being a little more with Taylor, Fritz, and with Sloan and Marty, I'm probably always committed to you know twenty weeks of travel a year. And uh, but uh, I'm still doing the traveling, even though I have you know my daughter's eight years old now, and my ste stepson went to University of Washington. My stepdaughter's fourteen. Um, you know that we love the the job, and certainly I'm home a little more, but. Um, you know, went to the US Open, went to Davis Cup, came back to Davis Cup. You know, I've still got some weeks ahead of me. So, yeah. but definitely there's a bit of management about being home a little more and trying to be the best dad that I can be. So I remember when I first started traveling, it was probably around that 16, 18, 20 week kind of thing. And then, you know, come home, everybody's happy to see you. Dinner's on the table. Welcome home. We missed you. And in 2018, I traveled 38 weeks. And it was, it was the year Sloan got to number three in the world. And yeah. around week 21, 22, I would open the garage and I would see garbage at the back door. And like, can you take the garbage out? And that's when I knew. I said, all right, we're starting to get to a point now where this is hard to keep up with, hard to continue, right? Where yeah. the welcomes come to, yeah. my car needs gas, there's garbage need to be taken out, can you get to it? I'm like, oh, yeah. okay, this is getting interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you look, it's, uh, I think Juan Carlos Ferreira is a great example with him developing um, Alcaraz and, and being with him 
I'd say nearly every week. And, and I'd be interested to see how that relationship's going to develop in the future with Izzy going to get, you know, an assistant coach and stay home a little more. And I do believe that most players benefit from two coaches. I think, you know, there's a fresh voice sometimes with one person can be, you know, four sets of eyes are good. You know, with, with Taylor, I was fortunate enough to work with Paul Anacone um, and Michael Russell, the three of us actually we did the project the last two years. So that worked out really well for them with that situation. I always see, uh, you know, Rafa's got Carlos Moya, he's got um, Francisco, and and I think it's uh, Lopez. Lopez, Lopez as well. So he's got the three guys that works for him. Yeah. And as all of us get older, we older coaches, we do have families and kids, and, and we've got to make sure um, we've taken care of that first. And I think that's one of the things that I, I we look at other sports. You look at football, you know, you've got decent defensive line coach, special teams coach, all these coaches, and you see them meeting and sort of converging on what we think is the best strategy. And, you know, in tennis, we don't see that. Well, a lot of times we see one voice, sort of at the mid to lower levels. But at the top level, we do see people collaborating and saying, hey, what do you think? What's best? What opportunities do you see? Is there something I'm missing? And I think when you look at the success of the American men, they've got that, right? You've got Brad Stein, you've got, you know, all these people who are open to collaboration. And I think that, you know, has been a big shift uh, in the thinking of American versus guys you're trying to hoard the player, take all the credit, be too almost like parental, right? And uh, in a way that limits the player's exposure to other information? Well, look, um, if you look at all our players that are now established in the, in a, let's call those eight guys in the top 50, they have great teams around them, just like you said. They're usually a very experienced lead coach like Francis has, Wayne Ferreira, since Wayne's taken over, certainly put a lot of structure in place. And you mentioned Paul earlier, Brad Stein. Um, Brandon Nakashima now has, you know, Franco Devine on the team. So everybody's got an expert voice and then, you know, some sport traveling. The strength and conditioning components become uh, not so much the strength and conditioning, but the physiotherapy role on the, on the, on the tour has become vital. These guys are all, inve- they're all investing a lot of money in their careers by traveling with physios now. In some cases, they do share it if the schedules don't work out, but that's a sign of, of, of being a professional and that you want to go all the way to the top. So the, certainly the behavior, the openness, the, the teams working together. I mean, you know, our USTA uh, analytic department's phenomenal with what the information that they've provided to every player that's, that's out there, um, whether the coach wants, is, is, decides to use it or not. But you know, Jeff, Jeff Russell and David Ramos and that team, the, the, the support they've given all the pros, men and women, has been incredible. And that's a great resource as well. So there's so many different components to a player, and it's a long path. You know, it's not just like, it, it's, it's a long pathway. You've got to have good people in place. There's family support. There's coaching, analytics, strength conditioning, physiotherapy. And it, it seems like it, it's the team model that's working. So last question, David, you've been very generous with your time. We got Davis Cup coming up. Um, and, you know, obviously the U.S. has got as good, a, as good a chance as anybody. You've got Italy that's always strong. Australia is always strong. What are we looking like in terms of our chances? And who have they, have they nominated the team yet? Yeah, the, the, we nominated the team on Monday. Uh, it's Francis, Tommy Taylor, and, um, and Jack, the four guys. So, uh, look, we're up against Italy on Thursday night, the 24th. Uh, great, you know, we Berrettini and Senna will obviously play singles for them. Fognini will probably play the doubles. So, it's going to be a war. I mean, you know, Taylor's handled both guys before. So, you know, I think that I'd have to look back at the matchups, but between the four, four guys, whoever plays that uh, between... Taylor, Francis, and Tommy, whichever two guys play the singles, it's, you know, the, the new format also creates, you know, it's not just 
five matches anymore. It's two singles and a, and a double. So the doubles has also become uh, a key. You, you know, it's tough to win two zero. So it, for the most part, come down to the doubles. Yeah. And uh, if we get through that, it's going to be on indoor hard courts in Malaga, Spain. And I think if we get through that, we play the winner of uh, Germany and Germany or Canada. Hmm. So you mentioned Jack Sock. And no matter what kind of year Jack Sock is having on a singles court, besides the Bryan brothers, that is one of the most gifted doubles players ever. I mean, what makes him so good? I mean, that, that boy can play doubles, period, point blank, yeah. with anybody. Yeah, I mean, he's won so many tournaments with so many different partners. I mean, <laughs> what makes him good is his racketed speed, his explosiveness, his athleticism at the net, and coupled with his experience of playing a lot of big doubles matches. You know, uh, you know when Jack has a four in at the, at the baseline, I think it's no, nobody at the net wants to volley that. It's, we nearly say it's unplayable. Yeah. And so, you know, it's got a great serve and got a good instinct. So really great having Jack as an asset on the team. Yeah. Well, David, I want to thank you for your time. It was great. Always great chatting with you, getting to know you, uh, your experience, um, you know, your expertise. So good luck in uh, Davis Cup. And we'll be we'll be seeing each other soon. Thanks, Kamal. Thanks for thank having me. Thank you so much.